We're going to end a very, a very packed and fantastic afternoon um, with some opportunities to talk to the speakers. Um, but I'd like to take the privilege as I, of, of really asking the speakers, each one of them, to reflect on the theme of this afternoon, which is making. And there is always lots of discussion and debate about societies being de-skilled, about manufacturing bases being eroded, about the rise of skill bases in China, but of little opportunities in our focus, which is Europe. And I'd like to ask each of the speakers perhaps to reflect on the key issues or a key concern that they w could or would identify in the current period around these issues of making. Um, Alberto, could I start with, with you, please? Yes, a pleasure. Well, first of all, being a gardener, I don't mind so much about the situation because I know that I am always depending from nature. So I can do my job, but it, is not, it will never be enough. And the second, I have also to think about, uh, for example, the history of this phenomenon of the Italian design factories and of Italian design. Okay. Uh, until all 70s, we could say that Italian design was characterized, without exceptions almost, by two facts. One being designed by Italian designers, and the second being manufactured in Italy. Then, during the 80s, we had, uh, we had this big change until uh, at the end of the 80s, one could not anymore say that Italian design uh, was coming mainly by Italian designers. Only the first element was uh, remaining the same, the fact of being manufactured in Italy. But then the Italian design factories were uh, becoming this kind of uh, research lab, opening the doors, uh, to a lot of uh, foreign designers. So Italian design was expressed also by foreign designers. And now we are probably assisting to another phase where it may happen that Italian design will also lose the other side, meaning to be not necessarily even manufactured in Italy. But what is important in my opinion is that uh, these uh, deep practice of a gardener must remain the same. Gardener in the, the metaphor of being a research lab able to attract the best talents in design. This is what, what I can Thank understand. You. Thank you. Ralph, would you like to make some comments on that theme? Well, I think you, you need an industrial base for design. It's not impossible, I think, to have design being done somewhere and the production complete somewhere else. Uh, I think it's very healthy that in Europe you have still manufacturing or take the UK. The problem is that you have very little manufacturing there and so the designers have to go to other countries and they cannot produce actually or design in, in, in the UK. However, I mean, when, when my father had the company, his ambitions and pride was to do everything himself and because he thought that was the only way to do, have the quality control. And that would not be possible today. I mean, we, also in our factories, there is more assembly than actual production. And we add the latest layer, the upholstery, etc. But many things come from elsewhere, and not just from Europe. So I think to, to make, to find a way to keep your industrial competence, so you are also a good partner for the designer, but also outsource whatever you can do elsewhere better is, is, the right, uh, is, is the right answer. And maybe with changing exchange rates with, India, with, with China and with uh, also some more ecological concern, we will produce more in Europe again than we, 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 we produce at that stage. It can come back. Certainly, I, th I think it's also true, and it's something that, that Penny and I were discussing earlier, that there has been a distinct move in the UK to close uh, education uh, undergraduate programs which are f the, the, the kind of core craft skills. Ceramics would be one, and, and four courses in ceramics and glass were closed 
uh, this year in the UK, and it's a concern. Um, and that ceramic link t takes me neatly um, to Bernadine. Uh, any sort of thoughts on the making and those issues from, from um, well, your experiences in Holland? What you are saying about uh, the education, um, I think in, in Holland uh, it's also a very bad situation because the um, education also of, of people who are very young and used to go to handicraft schools, I don't know how you would call them, but uh, that, that they changed all the school a couple, schools a couple of years ago into uh, sort of, yeah, how would you say that, Jürgen, help me, a sort of, uh, um, Ma not managerial, but very theoretical. So all the hand, hand craft mm. is t taken out of the system. Mm. I hear that they're putting it a bit back now, mm. and I hope so too, because I think it starts there as well. And for uh, that matter, um, Tichlar um, uh, has, for, its own con for his concern, Jan Tichlar's concern is to have the, um, uh, to can't have the right words. To his, there are about 70 people working there at the, in the company, yes. and it's his concern to have them, to keep them alive, to keep them working. So that's what he wants to do. So he doesn't yes. want to have the things made in China mm -hmm. for that basic mm -hmm. reason only. Beatrice, what about your experiences? I think nowadays there is a kind of globalization. For example, people from China are coming to study in Europe, mm -hmm. so they get an education also. But on the other hand, um, let's be honest, if we want to make a product for a reasonable price, because if you go to a shop, the first thing they say it's too expensive. So you need to take care about your costs. Mm -hmm. Our weekly hours in Belgium are mainly too high to make a good product mm -hmm. for a reasonable price. A good product, okay, but a reasonable price, no. So I think we as a manufacturer for some handling are obliged to go out of Belgium to find it for the same quality for a cheaper price. That's what I think about the situation. Okay. Well, th that's thank you for that interesting roundup. And, and I'd now like to invite any questions from the. There's a question from um, over here on the right. Alberto, would you like to? respond to that? Yes, I agree in that design is always done by two different paths. One the designer and the other the company. Each of them have to be very conscious about the possibility, the technical possibilities of, of the materials they are using. That's fine. But also I have to say that what we expect from designers is they, that they will ask us every time to try to break the rules, even the technical rules. This is the side of design, from the side of designers. That ask from the side of industry to be, uh, to know very well our job. And in that sense, we can, I agree with what Rolf was saying before, we cannot lose our um, center as a production. We cannot do everything ourselves, it would be completely out of the, of the time today, but we need to keep our, uh, our strong knowledge as manufacturers, as strong as possible. Beatrice. Well, I think we, I agree we are the center to put the information together and to make the last decision. So if the designer is trying out, we need to bring him on his place if he's wrong. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if the designer comes with an impossible ID. It is always a challenge to find out new production methods or, or new materials. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a challenge on the other hand also. Bernadine. Um, yes, I think I, I, I agree with uh, Mr. Alessi that um, you, you stretch, I think the, 
a factory or a company stretches his abilities and therefore it's developing, it's development, what's happening when you, so. Uh, I, I would like to build on, on Alberto's argument that a designer can know too much or too little and both is dangerous. Mm -hmm. If you take the 20th century, there was this great development in furniture design because the, the roles changed. Before, furniture was made by an artisan and an artisan knew everything. And it's very difficult if you know everything to dare doing new things. So you have a sort of a self-censorship. And in the 20th century, <coughs> these roles sort of separated. You had the architect as a, the concept mind and you had your producer. And the, th the fact that so many interesting things happened in the 20th century was because of that separation, because the architects wanted things that were very hard or impossible to do and the producers had to respond to that. And it was that dialectic, I think, that created the greatness of the 20th century. Okay, Any, let's, let's move on. Any other questions? Ralph, do you want to take that? Well, uh, an easy answer, an easy one would be the Panton chair, where it's one of the rare cases, I thought, where a designer comes with a very defined idea and the technology is not available yet and has to be, but it's, in, it's close. You, you don't have these ideas when the technology is far away. It's close, and in that case, the manufacturer is rather helping an idea that already exists. More frequently is that it's really an exchange where a designer has an idea, the, the manufacturer has an idea, and it it's gets, the, the who did what, when, gets lost in this trial and error process that design is, because mostly design is not, I have an idea. Mostly there is a problem, and there are many, many very frustrating steps to take, many errors, many trials, until a product is where, where it should be. So it's very difficult to say what in, in, it sort of influences, who influences whom at certain stage. You forget it afterwards because it's so complex. Alberto, do you have a, 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 a clear example of a designer who's impacted on the manufacturing technique and, or not? Well, uh, I have... Uh, I have worked with uh, several hundreds of designers, but I may say that no one of them knew my, actually knew my technology. Um, but what is in, because other way, they should have been engineers, and I'm not interested in having engineers designing uh, my stuff. What is, uh, what is good with designers is, is that they have a lot of curiosity about the way to produce and about the materials, but uh, they are not deep in the technology, and we are not asking for that. They are like, uh, for me, a designer is a first of a poet, and then a poet that in order to ex express himself needs to be produced, to use materials and to use technology, but they are not engineers. I think it's a little bit the same. When John came up with the idea of a dish in ceramic, which you could use on both sides, so his first um, design was a very thick dish, which was not able to make. And bon, then there is a discussion between the company who makes it, between me, between John. Bon, it's not possible. And then you try to find out how can we become the ID. And then you try out just till you find the right thickness to make the right dish you can use on both sides. So I think it's a discussion always. Um, yes, I, I think it's uh, um, uh, two different things if you stretch the company's uh, technical abilities, which is more on the architectural side. Uh, they have specific questions. I want this sort of glazier. And then uh, Tegelaar starts to work and find that out. And that's stretching the technical possibilities. But I think the designers on the, on the object side uh, stretch very much the, the significance of, uh, of the design and therefore also the understanding of the company of, and going over their 
uh, borders with that and therefore taking steps in understanding. Okay, let, let's move on to a question over here on the left. Alberto, w w what is the impact? And I guess China is the kind of the bottom line here. We try to, really we try to minimize with a lot of success this kind of impacts. Um, first of all, all, the, all what we produce uh, in um, cold formed metal is uh, still produced in Cusinal or on the lakeside. But then all the other materials, we develop all the design uh, process, uh, the, we do the engineering and then we subcontract. We subcontract almost everywhere depending from where we find the right quality for, uh, for any, any specific project. So we produce in France, in Germany, in, in Austria, in Portugal, in Turkey, also in China, in Brazil. And what we try to do is that uh, the, driving, uh, the driving energy is always uh, the design. And we try to, uh, to find out the proper producers in order to match with the design that we are needing for. So I don't, for us, it is really not a problem. Okay. Alf, what about your experience with the feature? Well, well, I see it more as a, a general issue not of, uh, of suppliers, uh, not necessarily Chinese or just suppliers. And of course, the more complex your product is, the more you also depend on good suppliers and on their know-how. And uh, if we deal, say, with leather, we are not the greatest specialists in leather, so we have to work with the best uh, specialists in leather to make our the, the products in leather. And uh, th that is the normal process. The danger is sometimes that you lose part of your own knowledge when you delegate it to others. For instance, in, take an office chair. More and more, they're specialists in mechanisms, and they work them for everybody, and in the end, you, 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 they are so strong and they, they do it so well that you start to depend on that s supplier. In the end, everybody has the same type of chair because everybody uses the same supplier mm -hmm. because the mechanism mm -hmm. is so important for an office chair. There you have to beware. And for instance, we, we are also very careful to keep the basic competency which make the object that we really keep that in, in house. Okay. Beatrice, the third partner. Any issues or problems that, that you've come across? But it is quite simple. Um, we are not able to do all the handcrafting ourselves. So if you want to make something, you need to go, and I don't speak about China, there are other countries besides China. You need to go to a country or a place who is specialized in doing it. So I think sometimes you are just obliged to do it, because if you do it yourself, you, you do it wrong. Mm -hmm. Bernadine, you're trying to keep production located yeah, in Holland. Yeah, the, produ yeah the, the production is located in Makam, basically. And sometimes, of course, you have, well, all the material, 99,9% .9 of the material is the clay, as you understand. But sometimes uh, there's like the wood uh, with the collection work. <coughs> And now we're actually again working with Dick van Hoff, uh, making, um, that's a secret, don't tell it. Uh, for uh, Milano, it's going to be um, uh, heat, heaters, um, wood heaters for in-house. And so, the, of course, there's a metal construction in there. And then you have a third party. But it's, it's going to be again in around the corner, sort of around the corner. And, and it, the quality, yeah, that's... What's it all about? Okay, there's a question. I think one insight we, I'm sure you had, Alberto, you had, I, I had, is that the creative person doesn't work for us. The creative work person is not working for Vitra or Alessi. The working, the creative person is in his or her own project. And hopefully that project <coughs> includes serving, but it serves the customer or the, the individual, not us. And our art, if it is one, is to create the overlap of the interest of the designer and, the int and our interest and create through 
sort of a, a mutual inspiration to create a lot of overlap. So the project of the designer and our project have, have enough overlap to then become a new reality. And the, the important thing is always of the designer and the architect to serve, but not to serve us as a company, but to serve the user. Bernadine, you, you have many titles and names to the role that, that you'd work in in Holland. Would you like to make some comments? Um, I, I, I need to hear the question again because I was just do, lost. Do, <laughs> the questions, I, I think, from the speaker are, are that yeah, do, there have been many words to describe, c curator, editor, gardener, mediator. And at the heart of, I think, your question is, potential differences. Is this a European phenomenon or is it something that is just not quite so explicit in America? I, I don't know the American situation so well, I must admit, but um, uh, I feel that in Europe maybe there's still little f or less fear, sort of fear. I feel that in America the question this morning also about American uh, design. I think that for my feeling it has to do a bit with a sort of fear of being against the grain, doing something out of the order. And um, I feel maybe that's the same as well with the, with the old manufacturers, that they're just doing what they want to do and therefore that, that role is coming above being a mother, a father, uh, uh, gardener or whatever. Mm. It's just put all the heart in there and then, I don't know, what else can you do? One last question or, lady there's a lady. I think um, design is still an emotion. So, a few examples, if I exhibit at a fair, the people who come to visit, the only thing they do is touching everything. They don't need to touch it, but they touch anyway. So I think the digital prototyping is very easy to develop on a very quick way something, but you still need always the real prototypes to feel the real emotion, the real proportion. So according to me, it still stays very important. Bernadine, do you want to add something? Um, um, well, maybe uh, it comes as a surprise, but uh, Tichla, uh, they don't do it in-house, but they use quite a lot of uh, prototypes, uh, not prototypes, but uh, models uh, made for the making the ceramics in by uh, the computer, or because I think that's the question. And uh, on the other hand, the designers, lots of the time, put older into it intuitivity and emotion in there with making things by hand, but then to translate it towards a usable uh, model, sometimes the computer comes in handy there. Mm -hmm. It's not something we don't do. <coughs> well, what about your uh, we work. We work with both, but uh, and to get some ideas quickly developed to sort of um, visibility, of course, the, the digital prototype is fine. But whenever we get so-called digital prototypes, we know that most of the difficult issues are just hidden. In, in, and we, we get to the real problem only when we do the physical prototype. What about you? 3D prototyping is unavoidable today in the project development, even if uh, maybe I'm a bit paranoid, but I really regret to lose year after year these uh, very skillful model makers able to work with metal. Also in some areas of uh, my products, for example cutlery, it is impossible to give an evaluation only mm -hmm. having in your hands a resin prototype. You need at a certain point to introduce the real material. Most notable, I'm working in a very traditional um, world in terms of production. My most notable contribution in that area is maybe probably the fact that we are actually producing objects that uh, never end. So the, the, the world to recycle does, just doesn't exist in my field.
Okay. <laughs> Ralph, what, what well, about as, as an industry, we have been working in the, what is normal in Europe now since, since many years that you, you, you work with a, with a green agenda when you develop your products, you have rules uh, like sep uh, easy separation of materials, mm. no mix that you can later, uh, it's difficult to, to separate when, when you recycle, etc., etc. Mm. Uh, in Europe that is almost normal, mm. it's not a big deal to do that. To go beyond, maybe, is a big deal. We, we use in our factories solar energy, and we need, uh, we use the, the, water, the earth water to warm building, etc., etc. Many, many people do that. The most important is, I think, what, what Alberto said, to do things that last, mm -hmm. and uh, that last a long, long time ago, possibly from generation to generation, things that are repairable and uh, reusable, and that, that is what, 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 what we, we believe in, as, as you do. Okay, well, I'd like to th bring the session to a close. It's been a fantastic afternoon shared with our four speakers. I'd like to thank them all, and thank you for listening. Good afternoon. <laughs>